morning. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us this morning, whether you are here in our Celebration Center or joining us through our live stream, or if you, I don't know, you were scrolling Facebook and this video popped up later this week and you said, what are those people doing? And you watched, that is worship. And so thank you for however you came to this time today. I know, it's so funny. It's like the preacher starts talking and everyone's like, oh no, I gotta go in and sit down. So I love being a part of church where fellowship, where building relationship is just such a big part of who we are. I think that is such a gift. So to continue doing that, um, I heard it's somebody's birthday today. I, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, Nana, but... I thought this was an opportunity to talk about another question as we build relationship with one another through our time of welcome, of talking to someone we did not ride here with today, of getting to know each other more as a church family. So as you're able, I invite you to stand and greet those near you. Share with them the best birthday present you've ever received. And if the people around you are not good gift givers, maybe the best one you've given. Let us stand and welcome each other. For those that are still standing, please keep standing and would everyone else join in. Thank you. I did not get up here fast enough. Sorry. When the way is difficult and dangerous, when evil comes to break us down and break us apart, let us still choose to carry on with each other. When power from on high strikes fear in our hearts, let us still choose the courage to persist. For we know that the love and power of God, which abides in us, will not be overcome. Please remain standing and join me as we sing our opening hymn, number 122, God of the Sparrow, God of the Whale. It's on the screens and in your hymnal.
Please be seated. When we gather together as a church family, it is our great honor, it is our great responsibility and privilege to pray with and for one another. And so let us go to God in prayer. Holy and mysterious God, present in the pillar cloud and the burning bush and the sheer silence, no one has ever seen you but you have shown yourself to us in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. He came to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of your favor. We gather this day to claim our commission, to pray that you pour your Spirit upon us again in powerful ways, that we might continue the mission of the Messiah. In cynical and despairing times, may we proclaim your hope. In a violent and angry world, may we offer your peace. Give us compassion for the dismissive and disinterested. Fill us with love for the lonely and unlovable. And when sorrows come, as they certainly have and will, Strengthen us to be with each other, to be with our sorrows, until joy bubbles up in our midst. May we be so captivated by your hope, O oh God, that we can't help but whisper and sing and enact the message of your reign, which is always coming into our world. Allow our whole lives to be channels of your powerful grace. We ask this through Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I invite Miss Janet up and I invite up our children, our youngest disciples, that they might hear a word just for them. Is that okay? You were here, right? Okay. Hi. So, um, the last time I came up with a box, do you remember what I had in here? Uh, yeah, a shepherd's sling. Uh, something different this time, because I want to tell a different story today. And I'm going to pull one thing out at a time here. This, what does this look like? Like a little, like, yeah, like a wooden, I don't know, something that something sits on, right? Okay, and look at the inside of it. It's kind of round, isn't it? Okay, so something round has to sit inside it. But it's kind of like a wooden bowl, you're right. What? A stump, it could be a stump, yes. But look what I've got in here. A crystal ball. A crystal ball, and this can go right on top of that if you want to just, you know, have it on your table. But you can do other things with this crystal ball, too. Like maybe magic. Yeah, we're going to get to that. Very good. And um, let's just take a look at this. If you look back, I haven't done this yet, but if I hold it up, can you see behind at the stained glass? Do you want to stand up and look at it through through this crystal ball and see what it looks like? What does it look like? It looks upside down, doesn't it? Yeah. 
And so that's one thing that people do with crystal balls. They kind of look at things and see how pretty they are when they're upside down. <laughs> it's cool, isn't it? Yeah, you can look at a lot of things through this. And what else do you think they might do with a crystal ball like this? They might take photographs of upside down things. That's kind of cool. What else? They can do magic. I knew you would get it, Oscar. They can do magic, or they say they can do magic with it. So let me put my crystal ball down here. Yeah, we're gonna, just, just going to keep it there. I'll let you take a look at it after church, okay? Yes, you can after church. So um, there are some people that are called fortune tellers, and sometimes they use crystal balls like this to go around telling people's fortunes, what's, what is going on in their life and what's going to happen in their life. And they make money off of this. That's how they make their money. So um, do you think somebody can really tell you what's going to happen in your life? No, probably not. Yeah, that'd be kind of a, a wild guess, wouldn't it? But this is how it works. Let's just say that Simon and I have never met before. And I am a fortune teller. And Simon has heard about me, and he comes to me, and he says, would you tell my fortune? And I go, ooh, well, let me look through this crystal ball. Let me gaze deeply into this crystal ball. What do I see? Ah, Simon, when you woke up this morning, you had a big brother in your house. Mmm. And then I look deeper, deeper into my crystal ball and say, oh, I see something else. Simon, there are two big brothers in your house. Whoa, and Simon's getting pretty impressed here. He's saying, wow, she knows that about me, and she's never met me. So then he says, well, tell me my fortune then. What's going to happen to me today or tomorrow? And I say, well, Simon, if you want to know your fortune, you're going to have to pay me $50. And so Simon's already excited because he feels like I know things about him. So he gives me that $50. And then I look in here and I say, well, Simon, what I see in your future today, you're going to have all the things you love to eat. Mm. And you're going to have new toys. And this is going to be a great day for you. Well, Simon's so excited. He thinks I must know everything because I knew about his two big brothers. So he, so he goes off, and he tells all of his friends about this fortune teller that knows about you and can tell your fortune. And those people come to me, and they pay me $50 each. And guess what? I'm making a lot of money, right? Okay. So there is a story in the Bible, and this is a, from about 2,000 years ago. There was once a fortune teller who belonged to an owner. Therefore, she was a slave. You know what a slave is? A slave is somebody who's owned by somebody else. And she was going around telling fortunes and making good money for her slave owner. And there were a couple of guys who came into the town where she lived, and all they wanted to do was go through the town and talk to people about God's love. That's all they wanted to do. They wanted to talk about Jesus. They wanted to talk about how Jesus loves you no matter what kind of day you're having, no matter what you've done, Jesus loves you. And this this slave fortune teller was going around following them and trying to predict things and tell fortunes and she was just getting annoying with them you know what I'm saying have you ever had somebody follow you around and just not leave you alone <laughs> yeah it's kind of annoying isn't it so one of the guys turned around his name was Paul and he did something about that fortune teller that quieted her down but it put him in jail. And to find out what he did to quiet her down and what happened when he got in jail, you're going to have to come to Vacation Bible School or you can listen to Jessica today. Okay? 
All right, let's end with a prayer. Let's stand up, and we're just going to stand up to say, to say this prayer together. Oscar, can you come stand with us? And the congregation, please remain seated, but just pray with us. So repeat this prayer after me. Thank you, God, for people who are brave enough to talk about your love. even when it gets them in trouble. Thank you for Vacation Bible School and everything we are learning there about your love and about the strength of your power. Amen. Here, I'll help you clean up. I think um, maybe some of our kiddos there had some firsthand experience about with the uh, people who follow you around and the feelings that might arise when, when people follow you around. Oh, you got, okay, thank you. Um, I was a big sister, I am a big sister, and so um, I have, I, I recall clearly those feelings of what that's like, so thank you. I invite our ushers to come forward so that we might pray for the offering that we will commend into God's hands this morning. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we know that all good things are a gift from you, that you dream abundance for all of your beloved children. And so, God, we pray that you bless this offering that we receive this morning that we put into your hands that it might do more than we could ever dream or imagined for the sake of your reign, for your kingdom. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Sorry.
You may be seated. I invite you to pray with me and for me. God, our help in ages past and our hope for years to come. Be with us now as we hope to hear a word from you through or in spite all that's said or done. In Christ's name, amen. So this week, we come to our final VBS story for the year. I'm sad. I don't know about you. Are you sad? I was telling, I was talking with the um, chaplain over at Austin College this morning, and I said, I am so curious about VBS curriculum writers and the stories they pick, um, because have we, did we read these stories? Like, I don't know. There's a lot going on here um, when we dig down into it. So I hope that this has been as fun for you as it has been for me and for the kids and for the families and for the leaders who have been in Vacation Bible School every Wednesday night in August to eat and play and sing and discover how much Jesus loves all of us. Our brave knights of North Castle have been putting on the armor of God. I'm I'm curious how much of this we remember. Um, hey, kids, they might need help because I'm going to ask the grown-ups some things, and, well, they might need some help. So if they could phone a friend in you, I'm going to point to a spot where I might wear a piece of clothing, and let's see if you want to— I mean, it's an open book test always. Um, so if you want to pull up Ephesians 6, feel free. But I'm going to point to an area, and you tell me what we put on to armor up, okay? So, so the first one goes here. The belt. Yeah, well done. Okay, and then this one goes here. Of justice, righteousness. Yes, I will accept all the answers because I'm a much softer grader than my spouse. Okay, and then um, on our feet we have... The shoes, the sandals, the socks of peace. Yes, the footwear of peace. And then I don't wear one of these on the regular, but I saw some of our knights wear this uh, last week. They had something on their arm here. The shield of faith. Yay! All right, we're going to get this. So we are going to be all suited up after this week. We are going to have everything from Ephesians 6. We might even remember it. It'll be great. So today we are figuring out how to put on the last piece that we are going to talk about in Vacation Bible School, and that is the helmet of salvation. I know. We're going to talk about this with Paul and Silas, but before we get to our text for today, I wanted to give us a little background, give us a little context so we get a running start. So we're going to be in the Acts of the Apostles, which reads like an adventure story. It's a lot of fun. It's a travel narrative following the people of the way, those disciples of Jesus Christ, the Savior, as they became apostles. So um, apostles comes from the Greek apostolos, which just means one who is sent off, a messenger. So a lot of Acts becomes the story it's a lot of Paul, but Paul is just going and going and going. Anybody remember an Energizer bunny? Yeah, this is Paul. He's just going all the places. So we pick up in the story in chapter 16. Paul and Barnabas have just parted ways. Barnabas took John, who was called Mark, and sailed off to Cyprus. Meanwhile, Paul chose Silas and headed through Syria and Sicilia and Derby and Lystra, where they picked up a guy named Timothy. You may be familiar with some of his work as well. When they get to Troas, Paul has a vision of a man of Macedonia pleading with them to come over to Macedonia and help us. So Paul and his companions go. That's what they're doing. They're going to all the places they can go. They eventually arrive in Philippi, a leading city of Macedonia and a Roman colony. They stayed there several days, and then, as was his custom, Paul looked for a place of prayer on the Sabbath. 
So while Paul is famously known for being the apostle to the Gentiles, he often starts his missions with Jews or those who are Jew-adjacent, those God-fearers, those Gentiles who worship the God of Israel. And in this case, he finds a woman named Lydia who heard and accepted the good news of God's love in Jesus Christ. She was a wealthy woman, a dealer in purple cloth, which was kind of a big deal, hard to make, only the elite could afford it. And she and her whole household were baptized, and then Lydia shared her home with Paul and his crew, letting them use her place as home base while they were in Philippi. And then we come to our reading for today, starting in verse 16. I invite you to consider as we read, as we listen, who in this story is bound and who in this story is free. So let us listen together for a word from God. One day when we were on the way to the place for prayer, we met a slave woman. She had a spirit that enabled her to predict the future. She made a lot of money for her owners through fortune telling. She began following Paul and us, shouting, These people are servants of the Most High God. They are proclaiming a way of salvation for you. She did this for many days. This annoyed Paul so much that he finally turned and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave her. It left her that very moment. Her owners realized their hope for making money was gone. So here we find our first bound person. This one might seem pretty obvious. This enslaved woman who is doubly oppressed. She's possessed by her owners and by a fortune-telling spirit. She's a woman of no power, no status, no freedom, yet she speaks the truth about Paul and his partners, following them around town and providing free advertising for their ministry. She's like one of those billboards on top of a car, just as loudly as she can, letting everyone know who they are and what they're doing in town. And it annoyed Paul. So sometimes we may not want the truth out there in ways that we're not ready for. And in a fit of peak, Paul casts the spirit out of her. So some preachers will call Paul's action here a healing. Some suggest that Paul and Silas were endangered by her words. But the text doesn't tell us either of those things. The words she shouts, the way she points out that Paul and Silas are also bound as slaves of God— annoys Paul. This isn't the first time in Scripture that a truth-telling enslaved woman confronts and annoys apostles. When Jesus was arrested and taken to the high priest Caiaphas's house, two different enslaved women who served the high priest accused Peter of being one of Jesus's companions. Peter, denying any affiliation with Jesus, implied that the women were mistaken, or maybe they were lying about him. So he didn't have to prove his case very hard because women, and especially enslaved women, were not considered trustworthy witnesses. You would never take their word in court. So some of us will read this part of the story and rejoice that the enslaved woman was set free. That was my first impulse, too. But free to do what? A useless slave did not become a freed slave. Rather, this woman was left to fend for herself with no means, no skills, no, um, nothing that we hear about. This woman had been treated like a commodity, and now she is all used up of no more value to those around her. So let's say it plain. Slavery is wrong no matter where it's found, no matter what name it goes under, because it understands people as only a resource as productive units rather than recognizing humankind's value exists simply because we are. Just because we are 
we have intrinsic value, whether I'm of any use to anyone or not. But our text doesn't tell us what happens to the formerly enslaved woman. Like so many women in our biblical text, she disappears as quickly as she appears. So we pick up our reading with the rest of verse 19. The woman's owners grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the officials in the city center. When her owners approached the legal authorities, they said, These people are causing an uproar in our city. They're Jews who promote customs that we Romans can't accept or practice. The enslaved woman's owners are furious, not because she pointed out that there are some apostles of God in town, but because their revenue stream has dried up. The woman's double bondage benefited them, and now their profit is lost. These owners don't recognize their own bondage, their own slavery to a system that constantly demands more, more people, more profit, that grinds people up like grain. So these owners of human capital bring Paul and Silas up on charges, but their complaint has nothing to do with what just happened. They don't tell the authorities that these troublemakers have ruined the woman they claim as property. No. Instead, they point at them and say, Jews! Cultural outsiders! These clever citizens know how to get what they want. They play to the fear that lies beneath every culture, no matter how civilized it may seem. Watch out for these outsiders. They're not like us. They're different. And as we all know, different means dangerous. They're poor and homeless and of a different race. So it may not be surprising what happens next, starting in verse 22. The crowd joined in the attacks against Paul and Silas, so the authorities ordered that they be stripped of their clothes and beaten with a rod. When Paul and Silas had been severely beaten, the authorities threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to secure them with great care. When he received these instructions, he threw them into the innermost cell and secured their feet in stocks. Paul and Silas are imprisoned because they are imprisonable people. They are vulnerable people who are threatening the bottom line of the powerful. So here these enslaved to God are bound on earth, beaten and locked up and shackled. But not for long, as we continue in verse 25. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. All at once, there was such a violent earthquake that it shook the prison's foundations. The doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer awoke and saw the open doors of the prison, he thought the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul shouted loudly, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for some lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He led them outside and asked, Honorable masters, what must I do to be rescued? I would suggest here that the jailer would be in the same category as the slave owners. A person in that society who had some measure of status and power, but which comes at the price of being all bound up in the system that requires harm for profit. He's a man under orders, and he takes those orders seriously. I wonder if he laughed when Paul and Silas burst into song in the maximum security cell of the prison, bare and beaten and bleeding. At that point, the jailer knew how the world worked. Hail Caesar! And he knew his place in that system, not at the top, but also not at the bottom, like these prisoners. And the jailer also knew the price of failure. When he saw those doors swinging wide open, when he anticipated the, his own punishment, a quick death at the point of his own sword seemed much preferable. But the prisoners hadn't run. And those who'd been harmed, those who seemed to be the most bound at the bottom of all circumstances, are the ones who called out to him with care, with a word of hope. 
It's too much for the jailer. This moment when the world is literally shaken and his understanding turned upside down, it offers him not only his life but a new perspective. So he asked these men, the one who had faith to call upon and praise God in every circumstance, what do I need to do? Depending on the translation that you might be reading, the jailer asks, what do I need to do to be rescued? What do I need to do to be saved? What do I need to do to really live? This precarious moment when he could have lost everything has woken him up to what really matters, where there is true power and hope and freedom. So Paul and Silas reply, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your entire household. They spoke the Lord's word to him and everyone else in his house. Right then, in the middle of the night, the jailer welcomed them and washed their wounds. He and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his home and gave them a meal. He was overjoyed because he and everyone in his household had come to believe in God. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus and you will be saved. You will be made whole. You will be restored to right relationship with God and with others. You will experience God's shalom. You and your whole family, even the servants, even the enslaved, and the jailer who had been this tool of the empire, believed them. It's not an empty thing. The jailer's faith is full and powerful. He's like a man who once was blind but now can see. He's like a person who once was lost but now he's found. It's amazing grace indeed. This salvation, the wholeness, the shalom that this pawn of Rome experiences moved him to respond. He washed Paul and Silas's wounds. He brought them into his home. He fed them. You may recall that in the ancient world, to break bread with someone was a big deal. It was to make them like family for the night. It's why it was such a big deal who the rich and the powerful invited to eat with them. You know, sometimes the more things change, the more they stay the same. The jailer, though, experienced overwhelming joy. Beloved of God, joy is a good indication that we're heading in the right direction. It doesn't mean that there is no sorrow or pain or vulnerability. Rather, when we find joy, it's because we're following our deepest calling to be in relationship with God and to be in relationship with each other. We're living out of our giftedness our God-given giftedness rather than a, maybe a dry job description. This jailer has been set free. But there's still more to this story. So we pick up in verse 35. The next morning, the legal authorities sent the police to the jailer with the order, release those people. So the jailer reported this to Paul, informing him, the authorities sent word that you're both to be released. You can leave now. Go in peace. Paul told the police, Even though we are Roman citizens, they beat us publicly without first finding us guilty of a crime, and they threw us into prison. And now they want to send us away secretly? No way. They themselves will have to come and escort us out. The police reported this to the legal authorities who were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. They came and consoled Paul and Silas, escorting them out of prison and begging them to leave the city. Paul and Silas left the prison and made their way to Lydia's house, where they encouraged the brothers and sisters, and then they left Philippi. You know, Paul may not be perfect, but he is certainly feisty. He's not going to go quietly when there's been injustice. No matter that he's poor, no matter that he's a Jew, no matter that he's been beaten and imprisoned, Paul is one to claim every advantage available. And one of those is the fact that he's a Roman citizen. 
The system messed up, even according to its own rules. So those empowered to keep the system in place come to the prison to enjoy their helping of Crow, begging Paul and Silas to leave quietly rather than report this breach of the rules. And Paul and Silas go, checking in on Lydia and her household before leaving Philippi. Like Paul and Silas, like the enslaved woman and the jailer, like the enslavers and like the violent crowd, the police, the judges, and the prisoners, we too live in the already but not yet of God's reign. Already Christ has come. Already we know the love of God. Already the grace and power of the Holy Spirit is present and with us. And yet this world is not yet what it's called to be. The creation groans. The beloved of God find themselves poor, powerless, pushed to the margins, silenced, beaten, enslaved, bound. Who is free? And how do we put on the helmet of salvation? I think a story from our past might help. So once upon a time in 1814, a 35-year-old lawyer heard that his elderly friend, a doctor in town, had been captured and was being held on board a British ship. Just a few decades after the Revolutionary War had ended, the U.S. and Great Britain were fighting again, this time over trade and power and territory. So this lawyer successfully negotiated his friend's release, but by that point they had all heard too much. The British were planning to bomb the fort in Baltimore. So while not technically prisoners, the lawyer and his friends were put back in their boat that was tied to one of His Majesty's ships, and they got to ride along in tow slowly up the Chesapeake Bay. On September 13th, the bombardment of Fort McHenry began at sunrise, and it lasted 25 hours. From their little boat, the lawyer and his friends watched through the rain, seeing the smaller storm flag of the fort whipping around in the wind, obscured by the smoke, illuminated by the glare from the bombs and the rockets. The Americans on board that little boat assumed that the British had won. I mean, who could stand up to all of that? But on the morning of September 14th, the large garrison flag, the stars and stripes of the United States, which was 30 feet by 42 feet, so it was no small flag, rose over the fort. And Francis Scott Key, who was a poet as well as a lawyer, was so moved that he pulled an old letter out of his pocket and started writing some verses on the back. You may know the first verse he wrote that day. I will not be singing. This is a tricky one. Tricks up even the best singers. But his verse goes like this. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? His poem has become our national anthem. And it ends with a question. Does our flag wave yet over the land of the free? In our scripture reading for today, we met many bound people. Whether they were formally enslaved or just enslaved to the system, the culture, the ruthless peace of the Pax Romana. And we found freedom as stuttering and staggering as it may be on this earth that is not yet like it is in heaven. This is the already and not yet of the kingdom of God. 
while Christ has come inaugurating God's rule and reign, upsetting expectations, and turning systems upside down, we know that things here are not yet fully as God intends. But we see the cracks in the walls. We see the wide open prison doors. And we hear freedom that rings out. Like the jailer who finds the freedom and power God gives, who is overwhelmed with joy, even as he's going to wake up the next day and have to figure out if he keeps following Rome's rules, depriving others of their freedom, or find another way to live and to support his family. Like Paul and Silas who throw liberation around like candy at a parade, grounded in their freedom and God, even when they are beaten and in prison. Like a church, a family of faith who offers space and time, love and grace to everyone who comes our way, who sees difference not as a danger, but as a divine gift. We may not be perfect, but we are feisty. Here we are, beloved of God in the freedom and power God gives us to pray and sing and remind the world that, what, that things will never be the same, to clear the roadblocks that all of God's beloved children might truly be free. I suggest that salvation is described as a helmet, not just for how a helmet protects what's in our heads, but for the crowning work of coming alongside God in ushering in the time of shalom, healing, restoration, wholeness. This is what God intends for creation. And if we keep our eyes open, if we keep our wits about us, we'll find ways to praise God no matter what, to bring down the walls, literal or metaphorical, that divide us from each other, and to free both the enslaved and the enslaver. This is the good news, beloved of God, for us and for all. Glory be to God. Amen. At this time, I invite our liturgist up to lead us as we affirm our faith together. Please stand for our affirmation of faith, page 881 or on the screen. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. On our way today. Uh, yoga is starting back up in person tomorrow evening. I love me some yoga. Um, so the full information is in the little red box in your bulletin. If you are watching the live stream, you're at home, you need those details, just drop a message in the under the video and we will respond, don't worry. Um, you'll find more invitations on that back cover, but I'd also lift up tonight, youth, five o'clock. We're uh, bringing snacks to share with each other. It's gonna be this uh, thing that Methodists do a lot, which is called a potluck. So good luck to us eating out of the pot that we will all build together. Um, and then next Sunday is our VBS celebration. Woo! I saw some beautiful shields. I bet we're going to see some pieces of the armor of God. It is going to be a lot of fun. If you know a kiddo in your life who's not yet been to VBS, we're still doing that Wednesday night. It's not too late. I'm sure they're going to craft a helmet of salvation that they can proudly 
display, wear, share with us on Sunday. So it'll be a great day. Be sure to be here. But now, um, let us sing our closing hymn, number 572, Pass It On. apologize for anyone I startle when I shout. Um, I am loud. I, I know people have told me. Uh, um, but the youth of First Denton left me with a habit. I'm not even going to say a bad habit. They left me with a habit of when we sing that song, we really do shout, praise God. And the youth there used to sit up in the balcony. And so you can imagine how we kept the defibrillator handy when we would get to that part and guess on the ground floor were not prepared for when the youth really did shout out, praise God. So um, my apologies for that. I'll keep doing it. Warn a neighbor if they haven't been here, and uh, maybe we'll shout it together. It'll be fun. It's safe to shout that in here, right? I don't know. How often do we go outside and, I don't know, you're, you're walking about in your ordinary life and you just shout out, praise God, anybody? No, so we're just going to practice that in here. That way, maybe out there we do it sometimes. You know, just try it on, see how it feels. Try some lovely shouting. In the meantime, receive this blessing. We are free by the grace of God to share God's love and to pass it on. Go, because there are those out there who are all bound up and need to hear it. And you are sent in Christ's name. And the church said, Amen. Amen.